these ideas that are invented by humans continue to have and have for a long time had violent impact on people's lives and dealing with them doesn't mean pointing out the ways in which they're made up and expecting people to forget it but pointing out the ways in which they're made up and then also recognizing the way that they yet still have deep seated impacts on our ability to be kind to each other and to give everyone a dignified experience and existence that they live which they're not getting yeah right everyone should have a dignified life most people aren't guaranteed that and that's wrong and there are all sorts of reasons why that happens and the demons that we carry because of past trauma because of fear because of a scarcity mindset because of oppression such as racism or gender injustice or ableism or whatever it is that you want to call it mm-hmm. uh, whatever your views are on economic distribution you got to deal with those demons you know you don't deal with them by saying they don't matter so like my relationship with blackness is my relationship with blackness and um i can ignore it i can pretend or i can just excavate it and see like how can it adorn my existence in a way that sometimes is heavy sometimes is light um but that i'm not afraid of yo ho you made it My name is Omar Shaker and I'm honored to welcome you to the Gumcast where we have deep conversations about the human spirit and what keeps us going despite the shittiness of it all. Our goal is to encourage you to feel seen, heard and understood. So tune in for real and raw conversations and become part of them on findgumption.com. Hey, this is Omar Shaker. Welcome to episode number 15. of the Gumcast where we try to untangle the topic of race through our own experiences and this one is with my very good friend Hatem Tayyib who I grew up with in Egypt we went to the same middle school and high school together and since then he has moved to Harvard where he studied his undergraduate degree and then he moved to South Africa becoming first a teacher at the African Leadership Academy and then the youngest ever dean of the school. Hatem is originally Sudanese and in this episode we're going to get into his experiences living and growing up in different countries including Egypt and we're going to probe and try to own to some of our own biases throughout. I hope this episode gives you some new tools to talk about tough things such as race and identity in a new way that does not necessarily push you towards guilt or shame which are sometimes propagated by both sides of the political spectrum when we come to talk about this topic and i don't think that is ever productive so here's another vulnerable gumcast conversation with my very good friend Hatem Tayyib who also since then has been promoted from dean to ceo so There's a lot that we will laugh about and a lot that we will kind of cry about. And at the end, I hope that you find this as cathartic to listen to as it was for us to record. Yo, Dean Al-Tayyib. Yo, what's up, Shaker? Thanks for uh, making it. Yeah, I'm so glad to be here and I'm glad we're finally doing this. Yes, it's been a long time coming. Indeed. Been very excited to have this conversation with you because you're one of the most eloquent people I know. You're one of my <laughs> oldest friends. I look forward to disappointing you. <laughs> Thank you, as always. <laughs> uh, but also, it's pretty special that we are doing this in Lamu. Yeah. Yeah, in a bright uh, afternoon, a bright new year. Indeed. Indeed. And I've been here for a month now, researching the book. And it's nice to have... Uh, nice to be able to explore this town with such an old friend and it's also particularly interesting for us to be recording this episode about identity because mm. i've been thinking a lot about identity mm. of my characters but also of myself mm. and i've known you since we were little kids you know growing growing up you were the only black person that i knew mm. and so it's um there's a lot to explore and unpack about our own experiences my own identity has been very much all over the place since i came to this island because mm. people here see me as 
a white European, uh, and I am lighter skin, but I'm also very brown when I'm in America mm. because I'm an Arab. Mm. And especially in this island, it's an island that where the Arabs came first and then saw themselves superior over Africans. And so if you're a Muslim, you're kind of like a higher breed here. Mm. And it's it's just, it's been really confusing for me. <laughs> yeah, I think identity has a way of doing that. Yeah. So why don't we start off with a story that can help the audience kind of connect with uh, your background and um, your relationship to this topic. Cool. Yeah. Um, I mean, I have a couple of thoughts and we'll see where the different threads end up taking us. Yeah. I'll begin by saying I'm, I'm grateful for the chance to have this conversation because it's not a topic. I, we had the kind of language to explore in your kids, even though we had a, having all these formative experiences everyone has when they're, when they're at that age. Um, also, like, you know, obvious caveats, like everything I can talk about is just personal experience, just like you can't uh, behave as an ambassador for Sudanese people or people who, who experienced being a minority at one point or another. My family's from Sudan. I was born in Kuwait. I lived in Oman for a long time, and I lived in Egypt uh, for probably the most important part of my childhood, which is where we know each other from. Uh, Sudan has a really fucked up history with race because... It's like, you know, just like most African countries or most post-colonial countries, is largely an invented border. But within that invented border, you've got a whole lot of diversity. But one big kind of dividing line is between North and South, or was before the South became independent. And in the North, you have more Arabized people, like my, my family, um, and in the South, you have people who are less Arabized. Pretty much anyone who met a Sudanese person, whether they're North or South, would be like, yeah, these are all black people. But within Sudan, people definitely talk about gradations of color as good or bad things. And I, I think probably my first knowledge of people talking about race as an important element of identity was in the house. Like, you know, my, my parents were bad people, but would make passing remarks when they're trying to describe someone, trying to, like, remember someone. They would use words like Ahmar or Asfar uh -huh. or Ezra, uh -huh. which are Arabic words for red, yellow, blue, to describe different types of skin tone. Who, who are blue people? Blue is very dark. Blue is very dark. Blue is very dark. Uh -huh. um, and, like, yellow and red are lighter, green is also one of the colors that's mentioned. Fascinating. Uh, but sometimes you would hear someone from North Sudan uh, describing uh, either someone they really don't like or specifically being denigrating towards someone from the South, and they'd say, Abt. Mm. And like they're referring to someone who's very black, so black they would be a slave. And like, you know, people in North Sudan traded in slavery. Uh -huh. So like, you know, from a young age, I don't have very specific conscious memories, but I know I would have been exposed to this idea of like, oh, interesting, like race has these gradations or blackness has these gradations. And like, at least for some people, it seems like the darker the gradation, there's some association with inferiority. Right? Um, but this was all what I was experiencing about that in the household and maybe when we met family members. I didn't travel to Sudan until I was like 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. um, I was living outside of Sudan. And pretty much I was always the darkest skinned person in the classroom that I was in. So at school, like the other really important place where I was being socialized, whether in Oman, like in Masqat, I probably had a couple of classmates who were either Sudanese or from other African countries. Uh, but in Egypt, when we were classmates, um, for almost the whole time, except for briefly in grade eight, I was the only like dark-skinned person by Egyptian standards. Right. And before we get into that phase, uh, I wanted to ask you about growing up in Oman. Yeah. When your parents mentioned all these different colors of people, how did you react to them back then? Like just being a little kid, what was your take on all yeah. these colors? Yeah. I mean, I remember definitely having a thought like. Blue people? There's blue people? Yeah, same here. I've definitely never seen a blue person. Um, you know, it's like, I, yeah, exactly, yeah. Robin Williams is blue, you know, blue man group. Blue man group. Later in life, you can see them, they're like, oh, that's who they're talking about. 
that Wim Hof guy in here gets, gets loose. <laughs> These people are just really sad all the time. Um, no, I mean, I think you, you you like you pick up this. Is, I mean, you learn language by uh, trial and error. You try it out. You try and describe someone and get made fun of, and they tell you more. And then you start to kind of understand, but it, it didn't stick because I like even right now I can't tell you exactly if it's green, red, yellow, or green. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. Me neither. I can't even imagine a green person. And I want to get back to this idea of you know is is color a hallucination? Mm. Really, especially since you you know mentioned all these psychedelic colors that <laughs> can be involved uh, that I'm sure a lot of listeners you know haven't also um, imagined before. Yeah. These received identities and like the to intellectualize what's what's grounded in reality and what's a human invention. Mm. But it's important not to dismiss um the real force that they have in people's lives, right? Like, and I, yeah, I'm not the person to talk about this, but um, it's a short step that someone could go from saying uh, racism and invention to like, I don't see race or to, uh, you know, as recently happened to um, a South African woman who had been invited to talk on this guy's podcast, this white guy's podcast. He said to her, like, she'd like, Nobody cares about race, so we should stop talking about race. And it's like these ideas that are invented by humans continue to have and have for a long time had violent impact on people's lives. And dealing with them doesn't mean pointing out the ways in which they're made up and expecting people to forget it, but pointing out the ways in which they're made up and yet, and then also recognizing the way that they yet still have deep seated impacts on our ability to be kind to each other and to give everyone the dignified experience and existence that they live, which they're not getting. Yeah. Right? Um, everyone should have a dignified life. Most people aren't guaranteed that, and that's wrong. And there are all sorts of reasons why that happens. And the demons that we carry because of past trauma, because of fear, because of uh, a scarcity mindset because of oppression such as racism or gender injustice or ableism or whatever it is that you want to call it Mm -hmm. Um, whatever your views are on economic distribution you gotta deal with those demons you know you don't deal with them by saying they don't matter I think you know belonging is the bigger theme here Um, and belonging is uh, essentially I think where it where it hurts at the end of the day, and we were unpacking some things from our childhood mm. uh, about that. So mm. let's let's fast forward a little bit into your story, our story, because that's mm. kind of where we meet, right? You're mm. you're in Egypt now, and you are uh, you just joined the like middle school. Mm. It was yeah, grade six, six, yeah. yeah, same. So that's where we met. But tell me more about. You know, the first few years yeah. and how it felt to be uh, essentially now an expat in Egypt. Yeah, yeah. Um, like, okay, so first of all, I would say, like, being in Egypt generally as a Sudanese person, um, you're a more familiar type of alien, if that makes sense. Like, in Oman, there was Sudanese people, but, like, not a, not a ton, and it wasn't a long-term relationship. But in Egypt and Sudan, that relationship is ancient oh. and every Egyptian that you talk to, uh, will say, oh, and like, blah, 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 and, and you have to kind of parse what they mean by that. But I think uh-huh. to me, it's genuinely like familiarity and friendliness, but also a little bit of like, you know, we used to rule you guys. <laughs> it's just like, okay, uh, cool. I'm glad that you have this grasp of basic history. Um, plus like, you know, uh, Cairo is a city Mm. and a man, like I was in Muscat, it's a tiny, tiny place. So I spent more time walking around in Cairo and was more subject to just random people Uh being like, ah, Sudanese, or like there was that, um, Hamadineri film, 
Yeah. Uh, Gamma and Mikaya that had that song, Shukalata. Shukalata. And so that song was a big part of grade six and seven. Uh-huh. Uh, literally random people in the street just being like, ah, Shukalata! Which, like, is both, like, hilarious and really irritating. <laughs> Um, which it's, I guess is kind of my experience of being Sudanese in Egypt. That's really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's both it both puts you in a box, which is irritating, but it, it's literally a sweet thing. It's like yeah, okay, like I'm calling you like a chocolate. They could like exactly. It could be a lot worse, right? right. Like there's a <laughs> lot of there's a lot of things that get yelled at black people in other major cities around the world. <laughs> they're a lot worse, and like it was never followed with a threat of violence or anything. You know, um, it was just kind of like, oh, I think the fact that you're black is funny. Mm-hmm. I'm going to point that out, mm-hmm. you know, and like I'm, we can speak the same language and we have shared culture. And then like every third person is like, you know, all this, the kindest people I know are Sudanese or uh, my cousin went to and married a Sudanese woman or whatever. So it's like it didn't feel like I imagine what it would be like for people who are black in Europe or people who are black yes. in Lebanon. Even I didn't mean, go that far away. And yeah. I, I imagine that some mm-hmm. of the what gets hurled is worse. But I actually I imagine that what happens for South Sudanese people in, in Egypt, of which there are a lot more, mm-hmm. and who are primarily there as refugees, and are more recent arrivals than North Sudanese people, and are visibly differentiable from North Sudanese people, uh-huh. it's probably a lot worse. Maybe even a little bit more salient. My first couple of years in school in Egypt wasn't my blackness as much as like I couldn't speak Egyptian Arabic as well as someone who's been in Egypt their whole life obviously Uh I was more comfortable speaking English because the friendships I had in the previous school I was doing it in English and so I ended up befriending more Americanized kids Mm -hmm. including primarily like Egyptians who'd been living in America and moved I mean like Ahmed's an example of that yeah like we became friends on the first day of grade six because we were like other the other students in the class were like, why the hell are you guys talking English? <laughs> you're like, because that's what we talk. <laughs> and then you ended up like in this weird ostracized group of kids, misfits from all the different grades who yeah. everyone thought was were pretending to be cool by speaking English when yeah. really it was like this is what yeah. we know how to speak. I mean, I feel that even in recording this podcast. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel that and I it's interesting. I mean, I relate to that so much because I had come from Kuwait from an American school, mm. uh, and the kids would make fun of me for uh, speaking again and like mm. you know, all all English mm. all the time. Mm. <laughs> that was literally what you would say all English <laughs> all the time. time. Um, yeah, thank you, Melody, for that. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I started wanting to change that so much. Crave mm. like being just like popping back into my Egyptianness, and it started like a whole, I guess, domino effect of trying to figure out, okay, what, what is my identity? Because really? mm. then at some point, I'm, not, I'm neither speaking Arabic nor English. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. You're, this is like, I, because I'm a hodgepodge of things, uh-huh. I'm going to express myself in a hodgepodge of language. Yeah. And if I can find people who that means something to, then the communication I have with them just like the communication I can have and we can have with the people we grew up with, is just more real and honest exactly. than most other communication we have access to. Absolutely. I, I feel most authentic in my expression when I'm speaking that hodgepodge, the mix between Arabic and English. Yeah. Nice balance. Yeah. <laughs> so even though I'm recording this podcast in English and it, I'm, I'm, I want it to be accessible to a wider audience, that's why I made that conscious decision, but... Uh, I imagine I would be more comfortable here. Well, than I'm mm. Arabic. Mm. Back to that idea of okay, like people are maybe ostracizing you about not just how you look, but how you're talking, mm. and maybe the ideas you have that they can't relate to. Yeah. What, what was that feeling like? Yeah. How did you maneuver that? Yeah. So, I mean, I think this goes back to this theme of like, um, of uh, like privileged disadvantage. I don't know. Like, mm-hmm. a privileged minority is like, um, you, I'll get teased uh, 
for like sitting with the Americanized kids or speaking in an Americanized way or like reading fantasy books before Harry Potter came out and made fantasy cool. <laughs> um, but at the same time, like the thing I'm being teased for, which is like reading and liking, like we're in an English medium school and like all the subjects were in English and there was English class and whatever. And I was like, like doing really well in class. And people were like, why the, who is this guy? <laughs> why is he getting these grades? Yeah. Um, and like, you know, forming, like, like getting praise from teachers or like other things that like, if the whole thing was bad, right? Like if I was being made fun of for this thing and it was costing me, like I was at the bottom of the class, I think I would have had a, a negative, a much more different experience. But here I could be like, yeah, okay. Make fun of me, but this is clearly going to be useful. Yeah. So whatever, <laughs> like, I don't need that praise from you. I'm getting it from another system of power. You know? Uh -huh. Um, which is a lucky place to be in. Like I could, that couldn't, that didn't necessarily have to be the case. I could have been in a different, like if the, if the situation was reversed and I spoke Arabic really well and I was at English medium school, which is the experience of a lot of kids who immigrate to Western countries. Yeah. Um, but I think it would have been, it would have been pretty bad. So I guess I, it was, it was fine. You know, like I, I was, yeah. it was the awkward shitty stuff that comes with being a teenager, but like, I don't feel. I don't feel traumatized by it. And that's the same way that I feel about my racial experience being Sudanese or black in that classroom. So that kind of brings us to the time where we actually started being friends mm. and hanging out. And I remember you having, uh, or, or me having like this, this perception of you as being like some kind of whiz kid, you know, like you're the, <laughs> you're the kid that had the highest composition scores for sure. I remember that. Um, later on the highest English SAT scores. Um, and then later on, being one of the very few people in our class that got into an uh, Ivy League school, mm -hmm. let alone Harvard. Mm -hmm. um, and so you were always like, uh, you know, someone with some magical uh, powers, <laughs> right? Like you, you knew so much. So it was interesting. It's interesting, like reflecting on that uh, and how that gave you maybe some resilience towards mm -hmm. the lack of belonging because you knew that you were excelling one way or another. Mm -hmm. Uh, but at the same time, I think we, we, we usually perceived you as having a very thick skin because mm. of these accomplishments that you had, which, mm. which we may have been envious of. But ultimately, we, we reached a point where we, a bunch of us misfits have been hanging out mm. for a very long time mm. with, with very little uh, outside world communication mm. <laughs> because we realized, okay, like we, be, we belong to each other one way or another. Um, but also like when I reflect back on like during that time going into high school there was a lot of jokes that we did just about the fact that you were black mm. which we you know then the interesting conversation is like alright what was kind of like the intention there what was the kind of uh, what were we doing exactly mm. right what, was this was this racist and mm. like what what is racism ultimately mm. because we were all bullying each other essentially right. and taking out our confusion with you know the testosterone that's like yeah. shooting up yeah yeah because yeah, yeah. we're mostly boys too yeah it's not like that in group was very mixed yeah and so there was a lot of trying to maneuver that maneuver yeah. our anger collective anger i guess about like how things are and like um whether it was like school or or country or like trying to get ourselves out of that box so like there was that I guess channeling of exploration of you know who we are in yeah general. Um, and part of that included us being so comfortable with each other that we're saying things that maybe now we would think very insensitive or hurtful, yeah. Yeah, yeah, needlessly yeah. hurtful yeah um, and especially if we talk to to other friends they may be really <laughs> appalled about what we would you know Try to what we'd be calling each other then. So, yeah. So I feel like you know part of me right now wants to really own up to that experience. Yeah. And say a lot of the things that I have said to you were insensitive. Yeah. The the intention was never to uh, hurt you, but but even like the what, when I think about it, like that is what I was doing. Yeah. So I'm yeah. curious to know first, like how how did that experience 
you know, how was it for you and how was it different from what you were just describing as, yeah. in as an expert? Yeah. Yeah. So um, it's really interesting to be able to talk about this stuff. Um, so thanks for creating space. I think ninth graders everywhere in the world and probably people of that age or in that socialization status throughout human history are assholes. <laughs> My um, is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> like, it's like, you know, there's so much chemically happening in your brain and like, there's all this like, just wrestling for social status and like, you can either remove yourself from it or like, participate in it and sometimes your fortunes are up and sometimes your fortunes are down. You could be the most popular kid and then like, someone puts chocolate on the seat of your pants and it looks like you shit yourself and you're done. Like, <laughs> you've lost it, you know? And so, um, you know, it's nice to be able to go back and uh, think about it and analyze it, but I don't know how much, uh, I don't know how much guilt we should carry about it, um, or shame. I don't know. Um, like before we talk about the race thing, we were all just constantly throwing around the homophobic slurs. Like it's the standard Right. The standard way to insult someone is to call them gay. Yes. And that's for like the most minor interaction, like someone accidentally steps on your foot or something, <laughs> or for like the worst possible thing, like if someone stabbed you with a knife, which never happened, but if someone did that, that would be the first thing that you, you right. respond, you know? Like yeah. that was just the basic bullet. Uh-huh. Um, which, I mean, I can't imagine what it would have been like to be not straight. Yeah, in our school or in any part of that culture, which is the pervasive culture and continues to be the pervasive culture, presumably. Uh, I would imagine no... that to be an even more terrifying ninth grade. Yeah. <laughs> and that's really hard to imagine. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I mean, I remember, like, yeah, like later in life, I remember the interactions where I was like, oh, this is actually not cool. You know, like I remember <laughs> the times I said things and people were like, what the hell are you saying? And then be yeah. like, oh, yeah, that is appropriate for you to react to me that way, but it took some time to all learn it, right? Right, yeah. Uh, so anyway, like, um, I think the the racial stuff, it's it's like, it's fascinating to look back and think about because I, because I see how, just like you were describing, people who weren't there with us react to when they hear, like, nicknames that I had or jokes that people would pull, like we were saying the other day, like, you know, school ended at 4 p.m. Like, it was always daylight at school. And still, though, we would be in the class and, like, the power would go out rarely. And, like, this light would be slightly dimmer. And then someone would be like, hey, hide them, smile so we can see you, right? Because it's, like, a way to break the... I don't know, just like, a, it's, like, an easy joke to throw. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I didn't feel... I actually didn't feel like I had less belonging when I don't remember feeling like I had less belonging when those jokes were made because I had friendships and because I had these other affirming experiences from teachers and from the school and like whether it was like student life organization or doing this thing or the other thing and like having moments where my humanity and my dignity were being affirmed like I had a healthy diet it was like uh, I would hope every teenager gets a healthy diet of getting their ass kicked and getting some cards with. Uh-huh. Um, so, I mean, these these jokes were kind of like healthy in the sense that they were challenging? I mean, or in the sense that like the world is full of wanton, uh-huh. unjust violence uh-huh. and you just happen to be the subject of one of the things that's like funny and out of your control. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I actually remember, like, uh, like there was this film of like this like a white girl growing up in Brooklyn, and she becomes a hip hop dancer, mm-hmm. and like she dates this black guy. I remember one of our classmates being like, "Oh, that reminds me so much of you and your girlfriend." And it's like, why? I don't dance, and it's only because that's a black person, and she's and she's a pale girl. And it's like, yeah, okay. I mean, I guess it's like it's a it's a thing that people can bring up to have a conversation and like, right. 
but uh, yeah, I don't know. I it, it, I don't remember. Maybe I blocked it out. I don't remember being really made to feel less than. Uh huh. Um, or when I was when someone was trying to make me feel less than, and they and they actually believed they were better than me. Uh huh. Um, I felt like the evidence didn't bear out their view of the universe, and so I didn't feel any responsibility to disabuse them of their huh. poorly held notions. You know what I mean? Like, if huh. you actually think you're better than me, then, like, sorry for you, dude. You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Good luck. Have a good life. But I don't think, uh -huh. I don't see any evidence of that. You know, that, you know, see what I mean? Yeah. I mean, I think that's where racism stings and is a problem. Like, people use it as a, as a, as a tool to kind of put that notion that you are the other and I must be better than you. Right, like, and and whatever entitlement comes from that, which yeah, I guess the the, the anti-racism movement is also trying to you know yeah. curb that. Yeah, but then a whole set of issues also comes from just generating guilt and shame around, you know, like the the like being woke and like yeah, looking at every joke and word as uh, curated. You know, thing to say. Yeah. So that's why I like going back to intentions rather than words, mm -hmm. and trying to unpack a little bit of these mm -hmm. intentions um, around because anything hurtful that you say, whether it's like uh, against uh, a gay person or a black person, mm -hmm. or a woman, uh, they're usually they usually tend to at some level, I guess, make us feel better about ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, and as kids, we were doing that. All the time, but yeah. it's because we were learning what it means to have sensitivities and how to like, even just, you know, be what it means to be sociable to begin with. What it yeah. means to talk to someone. Yeah. But it wasn't held, I think, at its core by the intention of um, I am white and you are black, and that's we're going to use these words to ensure that you know your place in the universe because. At the end of the day, like we regarded like our inner circle as safe, mm. at least the safest place. <laughs> um, and so it felt almost like we can explore some of these jokes, which you know, like some, like even when you say some of these uh, these jokes, I still laugh. You know, mm -hmm. I still think there's yeah. something comedic <laughs> about yeah, it. Yeah, the yeah, fact yeah. that we we're such assholes, you yeah, know, it's yeah, like yeah. hilarious how we would say something like yeah, that and, yeah, and, yeah. and just think of also. Um, yeah, how I think it's, and it's really hard to, to, to have that raw conversation between people, let's say in America or yeah. in South Africa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's interesting because we were kind of, yeah, we're making jokes about you being black, but really like we're not white either. Yeah. You know? And, and that became like very evident to like later when I moved to the States and yeah. I realized like, oh, I'm actually brown. Like, yeah, that's my identity in that context. Yeah. And maybe that's kind of what softens you over time is that you realize that whatever, you know, that, that whatever words that you didn't understand back then, mm -hmm. like actually have their weight. Mm -hmm. And it's part of growing up, you know, it's part of introspection. Um, yeah, I mean, a couple of things I'm reacting to in what you said. Uh, I, I think it's important to say that, like, my experience um, or our experience overall is, like, a really privileged one, right? Mm -hmm. um, I didn't feel unsafe. I wasn't excluded from opportunities. And that's, like, like you know, I didn't, ha I didn't come from a, from a heritage and a descendancy of being subjected to violence because of my skin color. In fact, like... My ancestors probably perpetrated violence because of their skin color, right? Uh -huh. And so, uh, my experience of whether they're aggressions or microaggressions, whatever you're going to call them, is much, 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 much softened and attenuated compared to someone who's in South Africa or in the United States or many, many, if not most places in the world, where there's a like their lineage and their, you know, their personal experience and their family experience and their daily experience is much more violent right mm -hmm. so you know i think um it's easy for me to say oh you know i didn't hurt that bad right <laughs> yeah well i wasn't being hurt you know compared to uh -huh. a lot of other a lot of other people 
Um, but I, I think like, I also think it's important to, uh, it, it, like what you just said, just, they are just words, <clears throat> but words have power and words can do harm and words make the world and words make the inner world or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, you know, one thing that you mentioned that was interesting is around this belonging point is like, I also wonder to what extent within the friend group, we all realized or felt that we didn't really belong big picture uh -huh. the place that we were in, right? Like we were in this subculture uh -huh. and didn't like, we felt misunderstood or underappreciated by our parents, by Muslim culture and like by the city that we're in and other people around us who are our age to some extent, right? Like we yeah. consumed different things. We had different aspirations. Most of us had some desire, if not a very strong one, to leave when we had the opportunity. Yeah. And I think that probably also for me is a thing is like, I, you know, I had this anticipated privilege of like, I won't have to make my life here. So uh -huh. even if I have a doubt in the back of my mind of like, you know, how many of my friends' parents will allow me to marry their daughter, you know, I'm not sure. Mm. I'm not that worried about it because, you know, probably I can, I can seek greener pastures, which has probably come back to bite me in the ass. Huh. Yeah. Huh. Just like non-committal. Because uh, the, the, yeah, the grass is always going to be greener. Maybe. You know, I'm, I'm just having that realization right now of being like, oh, uh, maybe I was kind of just waiting. You know, I was enjoying high school, but I was also expecting to leave. Right. Right. After Egypt, I, I remember you giving us a, uh, a, a graduation speech because <laughs> the school wanted to honor you as being the one who got to Harvard yeah. and uh, parade you in front of the parents, hoping for uh, the, their other kids to join the school that takes people into Harvard. And uh, at that point, I feel like we should bring into the story like that speech of yours. <laughs> It's a peak at the moment. Thank you for giving me the chance to talk about it. Please. Um, it had like, it. I think that that moment has come back in other threads of my life since then. And I'm just seeing the thread right now. So let's, let's paint the picture first. It's graduation. Cool. Graduation. We're in the school auditorium. Um, the, you know, we're about 40 students who are graduating. Uh, I was, I don't know if you remember this, but myself and Yasmin Beardy, one of like our super clever classmates, mm -hmm. were uh, the previous year we had been like leaders of the student life organization because they decided that the students in that class ahead of us were all clowns and they shouldn't give them that responsibility. <laughs> so we gave we had given the previous year's graduation speech together, uh -huh. and then this year we were supposed to do the same thing again. But then I resigned <laughs> dramatically for some really garbage reason, like a few weeks before graduation. Uh -huh. I think mainly because I wanted to have the dramatic experience of submitting a letter of resignation, uh -huh. <laughs> which is great. Um, but then they still let me give a talk, I think, because of the, or say something because of the same of what you just said. I think they wanted to be able to introduce the kid who's going to go to Ivy League school or whatever. Yeah. Um, and, I, and I had to give them my speech beforehand to review it, and I gave it to them. But then, you know, we're all teenagers. We've been going to the school that's very academically oriented very focused on exams, uh -huh. had strict rules. We felt like had strict rules. It wasn't that strict in retrospect. Uh -huh. And so there was this sentiment of rebellion that you want to express. And when I got to the stage, I had written an additional page that I took out of my pocket and unfolded and read the additional page, uh -huh. which was a critique, uh -huh. a critique of the school. Right. Um, yeah, and like I felt really proud to think that I was speaking truth to power. You yeah. know, I'd been given this yeah. podium and like I would say things and then the other 40 students on stage would be like, yeah, <laughs> so true, we're oppressed, you know? Um, but yeah, I'm sure if I went back and read it, it would just be like vague complaints about homework. <laughs> Dr. Giddings, the school director or principal, uh, found me in like the courtyard where we were celebrating and uh, I probably went to him. And I was like, hey, you know, I'm sure that was a bit awkward. And he was like, 
he said it all and he shook my hand and he, he walked away and I never understood what that meant but it, I remember it and like yeah I mean uh, sometimes when I'm dealing with teenagers who are you know being rebellious as they should be in my current job I wonder if I'm feeling what he was feeling huh. what is that feeling like there's, there's doubt there's a lot of doubt especially when you make a hard decision about a student that like you're gonna expel mm. um, like sometimes you have like yeah you have to make those decisions but you can never be 100% sure that it's right and oh. like sometimes the right choice is still harmful mm. and so you um, yeah you you like I think you anyone in this kind of job and a lot of people I think in education generally you accrue these um, these moral wounds mm. uh, and I, I think I worry about whether they're hardening me and making me someone that I wouldn't be proud of if my younger self met them. How do you help someone that's in their high school years, late teen years, maybe going into their 20s, um, that's kind of thinking of these things, that's exploring what it means for them to express their identity, like belong to a certain group of people, and, and generally like have more conversations that helps them unpack these demons, like you said. Yeah. What is something that you would tell these kids that or that we can kind of like, you know, send them in this time capsule that we're creating here mm -hmm. to tell them um, how these demons can be faced. Like, what is it? What does that entail? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, um, it's a great question. I'm having this experience. Um, yeah, I guess probably experience that most of us have where the more life you live, the more experiences you have, the less confident you are in the advice that you can give, you know? Yeah. Um, the things I end up saying to students are mostly pretty hokey and cheesy, but like uh, I'm my best shot at the time, you know? One thing that everyone should do as far as I'm concerned, as much as they can, because it has only upside, is read. I think that's, um, I think it's a way to build a relationship with yourself in a way that watching stuff passively just doesn't do. But I also think it's a way to build compassion. And I think there's research that backs that up that um, right. particularly reading, reading fiction actually heightens our emotional intelligence and builds compassion. Um, so I need to look that up for my marketing. Yeah. <laughs> you probably should. Yeah, definitely. This book increases compassion by 10%. Three so yeah, out of five. It could all be like evidence-based. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be able to sell this book in no time. 20% compassion plus 10% yeah. empathy. Three, three out of five former prison guards <laughs> gave up drinking after reading this book. So yeah, I read you're going to receive a lot of stuff um, and you have to take some agency in the way that you make it meaningful in your life. Um, so like my relationship with blackness is my relationship with blackness and um, I can ignore it, I can pretend or I can just excavate it and see like how can it adorn my existence in a way that sometimes is heavy, sometimes is light. Um, but that I'm not afraid of. Mm -hmm. And I think the last thing is like, just uh, be kindly suspicious. 
first of yourself, but also of others. You know, like when you see people really, really confident, but especially when you feel really, really confident, kindness is good when you practice it. <laughs> you know, I like. <laughs> I haven't found more elegant ways to say that. I agree. I agree. Yeah. And I don't think we need to back that one with research. <laughs> Just be fucking kind, guys. Exactly. exactly. The world is a nicer place. Exactly. Hatem, thanks for, uh, first of all, being here. And thanks for this wonderful Lamu adventure. Oh, thank you for making it happen, man. Thanks for taking the time during your holidays to entertain my whims and, and record this podcast and talk about some of the tough stuff. Um, and thanks for your friendship, man. Especially in this trip, like being able to find a comfort uh, in an old friend mm. in a new place mm. is uh, quite uh, invaluable. Very grateful for your uh, friendship. Thank you, Omar. Yeah, no, thanks. Thank. First of all, thank you for uh, thank you as well for making Lamu happen. I probably wouldn't have ended up here otherwise. I've enjoyed myself. Um, thanks for this conversation, which definitely uh, is therapeutic. Uh, so even if the sound turns out terrible and you can't publish it, I've gotten what I need out of this. Same uh, <laughs> um, And then, uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, thank you for your friendship, but also thank you for this project that you're undertaking. It's really inspiring to see, like, this stuff is super complicated and there's not many voices, well, there's infinite voices, but there's not many voices that um, I can relate to on the same level. And it's very cool to see someone work through identity and masculinity and power and hate and how to live life um, in a way that you can feel uh, at least comfortable with, if not eventually proud of. Um, and like putting your stuff out there uh, and like having the messy creative process out in public, it's, it's, um, it's, it's genuinely inspiring and uplifting um, and I'm sure like really hard and scary and uh, tough. Um, so uh, I appreciate I appreciate you and I appreciate the work and um, yeah, I look forward to seeing more of it. Well, without you listening and all that support, it's it's not as fun. So <laughs> thanks again for entertaining all of that, man. And uh, as the kid with the highest composition score. <laughs> So it means a lot coming from you, man. Habibi! Habibi! Thank you so much for listening this far. I would really love to hear from you which parts of this story or stories that we've shared resonated with you. What did you think of the conversation? And what stories do you have to share with us about race and identity and our collective struggle with it. You can engage with this project and share your thoughts on findgumption.com. That's find, F-I-N-D, gumption, G-U-M-P-T-I-O-N.com. You can comment and send me emails and get updates on everything from the newsletter to poetry and updates about the novel, but also you'll get notified about episode 16, which is about heartbreak. And one of the big changes that I went through last year was a divorce. And this episode is with Shireen, my ex-wife, who was also featured on episode number five. And this time it's about the changes that we go through while experiencing heartbreak and we shall be reflecting on our own heartbreak in our own relationship breaking down and processing it in real time <laughs> as crazy as that sounds on the next episode so stay tuned subscribe on the channel if you haven't and i'll see you next time Special thanks go out to Mustafa Al-Azabi, who is producing this gumcast to make it sound crisp and clear for your auditory pleasure. <laughs>